So, uh, hi everyone. I'm going to talk to you, to you about uh, migration to testing and visualization, or how do I beat the freeze deadline? That was basically my main issue. I didn't intend to work on release team tools, but in the end, that's what I did. So I'm going to split this in uh, several parts. The first quick one is just about context. Uh, then I'm going to talk about migration to testing, which is like the core of this, this talk, and uh, how we can vis visualize what's happening and what's holding back some migration um, of packages to testing, and then some openings uh, as usual. So. Uh, just a show of hands, who maintains at least one package in Debian? Not quite everyone, but almost. And who keeps an eye on the status of the migration of this package to testing? Or the other way around, who doesn't care? Okay, no one. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, who already noticed that the package was blocked from migration because of another package? Okay, so still people. And who had troubles understanding why and how many packages were uh, included in this migration problem? Oh, still some people. The other ones, you can stay here. Maybe you'll uh, learn some bits anyway. And I'm not going to talk uh, a lot about my company, but basically I'm doing Debian work uh, as a volunteer, uh, but also um, as a consultant. And I'm mentioning this because when I'm doing systems administration, I tend to not do manual work, so I automate stuff. And you can do that with Ansible. I know Evolix people uh, already use it quite a lot, but there's also Puppet that I'm using um, for the centralization aspects um, that makes it possible to automate many tasks and keep track of everything happening on some infrastructure. But one of the tiny little issue I'm getting is how do I monitor uh, possible issues with the infrastructure I, um, I deployed? And there, there are many ways to, to address this uh, problem. Uh, you can use a full-blown solution like Foreman, which um, can be plugged with, uh, with Puppet, but comes with uh, DHCP server, Pixie server, and many other capabilities, so maybe it's a bit too much. Uh, you can switch to Puppet Enterprise, which has some uh, web interface to look at reports and so on, but I don't want to pay some, subscri uh, some subscription just for that. Uh, so on the uh, other end of the spectrum, you can just look at the YAML report yourself, parse them, and then maybe send some notification. So I started with that. Um, it's not really reasonable to ask people to look at uh, reports themselves. And the, the middle ground is Puppet Board, uh, which uh, replaces Puppet Dashboard uh, using Puppet DB. Puppet DB will collect uh, many information about your Puppet setups, your nodes, and so on. And Puppet Board uh, will just be a web interface to Puppet DB. But my new problem is that PuppetDB was not in testing. So that's the starting point of my little journey with um, release stuff. So what can prevent the migration of a package uh, from unstable to testing? There are many possible reasons. Uh, maybe it's not old enough, it hasn't uh, spent too um, enough time in unstable, so maybe there are some underlying bugs that were not discovered yet. It can, has in it can have uh, new release critical bugs compared to the version in testing. Uh, it can come with uh, dependencies that are not satisfied in testing, maybe some build dependencies that are not satisfied in testing. Uh, and many more issues uh, we have, uh, over time, we've put some efforts into testing packages and not letting users only test packages. So we've got few parts that test um, installation, upgrade, and removal of packages on some automated fashion. 
And we've got some continuous integration uh, with ci.debian.net, which makes it possible to run some automated package tests. So auto PKG test is something that you can um, put into your source packages so that they get tested automatically. If there are some regression, your package might be blocked. But if you've got some automated tests, maybe you've got some bonus, like you migrate early because it was tested by some infrastructure bits. Anyway, some other possibilities. Your package might be blocked because some release manager puts uh, an explicit block on it. So that's basically what the freeze is. We block all packages. And it can be kept out uh, of testing because the, the Debian installer release manager decided that, oh, I'm working on a Debian installer release, so I'm going to freeze all packages that might have some impact on the installer. So that's the blog UDEB hint, uh, which uh, prevents some, um, some more migration. Or it can be many, if not all, of the above. We've got some really not bad package, but uh, packages that are in um, non-releasable uh, state. So they are kept out of, of testing or maybe even removed from testing if they, if they migrated before. And trying to understand which part is blocking uh, might be a bit, um, a bit tricky. To understand what's happening, we've got the package tracker. So you can use tracker.debian.org slash pkg slash the name of your source package to get some information. But we've got the excuses page as well. Um, that one lives under release.debian.org. It's related to Britney, which is our tool which automates uh, computations, what can be mi migrated, uh, which package must go together with another one, and so, and so on. So, um, as we'll see in some screenshots uh, uh, right after that, you might have to follow some links to get more information because some more packages can be involved. So, for example, here, uh, relatively easy uh, packages are um, As you can see, uh, it's migrating after another one. So um, maybe that other one might need some other package uh, in turn and so on. It's too young. It just got uploaded. So it's, it, it has no opportunity to get widely tested. Uh, Pew parts is OK. So it can be installed, upgraded, and removed. Um, but in the end, because it was uh, taken a few days ago, uh, it's blocked because we're in deep freeze anyway. But uh, I'm going to concentrate on the first uh, bit, the migrate after bit. Um, here we have basically the same information, but on the release team uh, side, uh, so that's the excuse page. Uh, as you can imagine, we basically uh, copy paste from one to the other one. And a little less easy case is GitLab, which migrates after many GitLab dash something uh, package or Golang packages or Ruby packages. Uh, plus, it introduces some new bugs. And so there are many reasons not to, um, to let it migrate right now. And that's another part of the excuses page for uh, GitLab. So everything in blue is a link, so you can click and move around in the page and get more information about your, your package. But basically, it's a bit cumbersome to keep track in your head that, oh, OK, there's this package and also that one, or maybe I'm forgetting that one because the name are closed, but and so on. So basically, what do we do? Uh, how does it scale when you've got too many packages involved? So that's where uh, visualization uh, comes into play. Uh, the first solution is pen and paper. I'm no artist. Really, no. I can barely read back my own handwriting. Uh, and it might be a bit uh, hard to uh, like start drawing something and then figure out that, oh, uh, but I need some more uh, place to put this and that in that package and so on. 
So it, it, it basically didn't work at all for me. The second solution is manual graphics, uh, which is uh, a piece of software which makes it possible to describe a graph. Like, I want to draw a graph which is or isn't uh, directed, so with like um, transition between two, um, two edges, uh, the direction is important or not. And you just describe with a specific language, which is called DOT, which is also the name of one uh, of the graphics tool. And you run a command that will pass your uh, graph source and generate some picture. So basically, you just have to describe your graph, and it's going to compute some layout that makes sense for this uh, set of uh, nodes and edges and so on. So that was basically the, um, the quickest way to, to get some information and maybe it can be automated. But let's look at the manual graphics part. The algorithm is really simple. You start with the package you're interested in. So in my case, that was PuppetDB. You look at all the packages that are involved, so with the migrates after that we saw earlier. You would register a relationship between PuppetDB and package one, package two, package three, and so on. And then you look at package one and then figure out whether there are some other package involved, and you do that recursively. It's really easy except you need to be really uh, focused and not miss any package and not uh, look at the same package twice. Here's what it can look like. So um, we've got, uh, I'm not going to, to, to look too deep uh, into uh, the dot language uh, specification, but basically we've got a directed graph uh, I'm going to be uh, organizing the layout from left to right. It can be top to bottom or more, some other stuff. And I want the nodes to have the shape of a box because by default that's some kind of ellipsis and it's not really rendering too, too good. And the first step was uh, PuppetDB migrates after this and that and that and that other uh, package. Each link can be uh, given a different color, so that was blue for all of them for unrelated reasons. And then, once you've got that first part done, you look at du jour, version check closure, and then honey SQL closure, and so on. But looking at du jour version check closure, oh, it depends on Puppet Labs HTTP client closure, which in turn depends on this other package and that other package which themselves depend on other packages. So it's really um, annoying to go and do some really manual work and make sure that you're not forgetting anything. So that was step two, or at least part of step two. And when you're all done, I didn't count the number of steps, but there were way too many transitions. So uh, 36 total. And I was glad I didn't try to, uh, to do that by hand because I wouldn't have enough paper anyway. So that's a set of packages that were pre preventing PuppetDB uh, from migrating to testing. So that was all the packages I needed to fix or to look at to get PuppetDB possibly in shape before uh, the freeze deadline. Because at some point we don't allow any new package in testing. So basically, um, at this point, I had a good idea which packages might be involved in, um, in this issue. So I checked uh, release critical bugs, uh, failure to build from source. So basically, uh, many closure packages had test failures that were depending on file ordering. So depending on the order in which tests were run, so-called unit test, <laughs> where depending on some other unit test, and that could work or not work depending on uh, file ordering on the file system. So it was a bit tricky, but basically the same kind, uh, the same class of bugs. 
So once you figure out what, what is happening, you just run them in some specific order, which makes it work. And you fix many bugs, and you get some packages reviewed, uploaded, and stuff should be better. Uh, but then, how do you check where we're at? Like, may, half of the packages uh, in the previous graph were fixed. Some of them might have migrated to testing, but then how do I check what the current situation is? Do I redo the steps before, like go through all packages again? I don't want to do that. So the, um, my next step was, OK, we've got the ball rolling. We've got PuppetDB people, Clojure people involved. We've got some packages fixed. So I'm going to take a step back and try and automate what I did manually the first time. Because once you do um, something manually, you can understand, every especially when it's repetitive, you know exactly what uh, step must be done, in which order, when do you stop, and so on. So I look back at some, some preliminary work I did years ago when I joined the release team in 2013, I guess. Uh, at the time, I was looking at, at the excuses page, the HTML version, and I was parsing HTML. So that's a re recipe for not really disaster, but you've got to update uh, because uh, the, your, your scripts and regex and so on, because the HTML version was not stable. You could have some strings that were um, edited uh, slightly, so what worked back in the was not working uh, after a while. And basically, that was uh, a really nice idea to, to get graphs at the time to understand uh, what was going on with packages. But in, uh, in the long run, uh, we don't want to do that anymore. So it was time to switch to machine-readable things. And fortunately, we've got machine-readable excuses. So instead of looking at HTML files, there's also an excuses.yaml file that you can um, like uh, pass with uh, real tools. And they are also uh, saved and archived uh, for later use. So you can look at exactly what happened on the very first Britney run on the 1st of February this year. But also, you can look back into previous years and so on. So here, it's just an excerpt uh, on the PuppetDB entry back in uh, early February. Uh, we see there's an entry with dependencies, so the migrates after with all the packages we've seen before. We've got an excuses uh, item, which oh, r very much looks like what's in the HTML page. We see that not uh, that uh, this package is not a candidate because it's being blocked for whatever reason. It's not going to be considered for migration to testing. Uh, we've got some administrative via, like uh, version and so on. And under policy info, we've got the many reasons why this package was not a candidate. The age requirement was OK. It's, it's been in Ansible for um, more than 100 uh, days, and it only needed five. So that part was really OK. The auto package test was failing, but it has always failed. So that's not a regression. So the verdict is passed. So that was not a blocker. Um, and then we've got uh, some other checks on block, I guess, is there a block hint or something like that? Uh, and build depends and so, some other stuff. I'm not going to, to look into all of them. I'm go just going to note that there was a release critical bug anyway. Uh, basically, the package was not working at all. So it was not a good idea to, to try and push it into testing at this point anyway. So. Based on this uh, YAML file, it's really easy to iterate over all the packages, maybe limit yourself to one set of packages that you want to, to look specifically into, or to generate a, 
not one graph, but as many graphs as there are clusters, so sets of packages that are depending on each other, and then look at the big picture um, for... Uh, so the big picture is split into many graphs, but you've got a clear picture for all of the, um, of the set of packages. So I'm going to switch to a browser. So uh, that's a page that was generated with what's in the archive today. Um, one might argue it doesn't really make sense because we are all frozen and so on. But looking back a few months ago, uh, that was looking basically the same way because packages that were ready or getting ready on a regular basis were migrating to testing anyway. So it, it was uh, basically looking the same. So we've got uh, many packages involved and a really, 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 really big picture. So I'm not going to look at that one specifically. But um, the, the idea of this page was to have some kind of, of a view for, for example, release team members to have a feeling what is going on, what is blocking, what are the big set of packages and so on. It will have an easy way to uh, search for a package and get the appropriate graph. I'm going to look at some other, uh, s some specific graphs that I picked uh, earlier. The first one is, again, Avril. Uh, I said that was a really easy case. At first, I thought there was only Erlang Cowboy, but in turn, there's also Erlang Ranch. So it's really like look at look based or something. Uh, but still, pretty easy to figure out. You could have clicked through two packages. Uh, here we have an example of some uh, specific uh, topic, which is Android, Android uh, tools. You see that packages can depend on some other package that itself depend on the first one. You, you can have uh, circular dependencies. And on the left side, I try to, um, to inject um, some, some extra information, which is looking into not only source packages, uh, which uh, we have seen all the time, but also look at the binary packages. Because one of the reasons for packages not to be a uh, candidate for migration is uh, dependencies between binary packages. And sometimes you can have dependencies on package A or package B or package C. And you can also have provides. So a package is provided by another one. So I've tried to work on uh, implementing some uh, binary lookup. So that's why there are gray, uh, gray boxes uh, on some graphs. That, was, that one is another uh, specific ecosystem, which is Kodi. Uh, Previous, previously known as XBMC, which is basically a TV station of some sort. Uh, you can see that some add-ons package depends on many, many, many uh, packages, which themselves depend on a common uh, package, which, which is uh, some platform uh, package. Uh, that other one is... Um, kind of uh, outlines the link we can have between uh, different tool chains. So here we have Octave, uh, which is uh, math oriented, uh, which depends on GCC. And we see some uh, uh, tool chain, cross tool chains uh, packages, which also depends on GCC. That one is about Perl packages. So apparently, all of them depend in some way on uh, some HTML parser. That one is for PHP. That one is for Ruby. That one is a bit larger because apparently some people don't really care about like the release schedule in Debian and upload their package anyway to Unstable even if there is no way they are going to migrate to testing. We try to convince people not to do that, 
apparently we fail for, with some people. So R is a prime candidate for, hey, look, everyone depends on R base, and everyone is blocked because of this specific dependency. But we're in freeze anyway, but still. You can have some really big graph like that, but that one really is really, really, really small. When you compare to Haskell packages, we have many rebuilds and package name changes and so on. And it's not going to, to render in my Firefox, it's going to be eating all RAM, and so I'm not going to complain about that anymore. That one is um, for updating your firmware on your, um, on your machine. Uh, we see some signed packages, which depend on uh, the source package they were um, originating from. Uh, a similar package is shim, which is the really uh, small part that we try to, to use uh, for secure boot before we switch to grub. Uh, if you want to read more about uh, science stuff and so on, I've got a blog article um, detailing uh, some, some bits. But basically the same is happening with Linux, but we don't tend to block Linux for too long, so it already migrated at, uh, at this point. And if you wonder why Kubernetes didn't make it into testing, that might be um, um, one or many of those packages that were not in shape, and maybe Kubernetes itself that was not in shape, but uh, those are the parts we are missing in testing to, to get Kubernetes. But again, we're frozen right now, so it wouldn't migrate anyway. So, uh, getting back to, uh, to my Puppet DB uh, um, uh, treasure hunt or something like that, um, that's a slightly different graph where I took some notes, I end edited my dot file to um, mention uh, release critical bugs like the depends on the left bottom side or FTBFSs, so the failure to build from source, or security issues with CVE and so on. So it, it really uh, would be better to have more information on the graph, not just the set of packages involved, but for each and every one of them, get an idea whether their age is okay, whether they are RC bugs, whether they are dependency issues, uh, and so on. But one of my uh, issues right now is how do we get that into the graph? Because there are already possibly many packages involved, and I would like very much to have some maybe input during questions or later in the day regarding some kind of image format that would let me um, have more information, have a bird's eye view right now, and then uh, make it possible to click on some item or figure out some color code to figure out which package could be ready with just like uh, one day or two of waiting, or maybe with just one bug fix or something like that. So uh, I was anticipating a little. So more, um, more data on the graphs. Uh, we I didn't mention it, but we could have the hints by release manager, for example, uh, the unblock uh, that we that we use during freeze time. Um, we can change we can change the age requirements as well. We can say, hey, this package is urgently needed in testing, so we don't care about its actual age. We want it right now. Um, I mentioned uh, block UDEB and so on, but basically every hint we can give uh, Brittany to which can impact a package would be welcome on those graphs. And as I said, some, some way to make that clickable, zoomable, expandable, or foldable, and like, I need some input because I don't know anything about visualization anyway. Um, and everything is good, except those graphs are um, PNG or SVG, but I'm not sure how accessible 
an SVG with uh, relationships uh, is. So maybe it would be good to have some way of getting the dot language and then transform it into some like text, be it in English, maybe localizable and so on. So we don't need to actually see the graphs to understand what's going on. And on the infrastructure side, I would like to integrate that onto release.debian.org, so in the Brittany area, but also maybe on the tracker uh, pages so that we can click on, uh, on a given package and then get the appropriate graph uh, generated from, uh, for this specific package. And as I mentioned, I try to, to work on source and binary mapping, but then you need um, the sources file uh, from the archive to actually get the, the mapping. So I wanted, especially when looking back at some old excuse.yaml uh, file, uh, automate grabbing the, the, um, the relevant sources file directly from snapshot.debian.org so that we can have the, um, the appropriate mapping uh, between source and binary packages at the time. So thank you so much for your attention. You can read more about some stuff I do with my company. Um, and for example, uh, I mentioned the sign packages, the, the secure boot stuff uh, on my company's blog. And questions are welcome. We've got eight minutes. Build dependencies, so I understand that you check build dependencies only. I understand. Okay. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> That's enough. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I understand that you check build dependencies only on AMD 64. Is that right? The build dependencies for um, Arch specific uh, binaries. Uh, so the build dependencies and the build depends Arch are checked on all the architectures where the binaries are available. And the uh, build depends in depth are first checked on AMD64. If that doesn't work, they are checked on all the architectures where there are binaries. And if that doesn't work on any other ones. Uh, so that should find a solution if there is one. Okay, so, so that means uh, if build dependencies are not satisfiable in testing on at least one architecture, then the package will not migrate. Exactly. Right. Okay. But that was implemented fairly recently. So at the beginning of the uh, Buster release cycle, uh, only the Arch specific ones were checked. So there were some packages that migrated to testing. Uh, that were not, uh, where the build dependencies were not available. So that problem should be solved now, but it wasn't uh, a year ago. Okay, thank you. Thanks for, Thanks for your great talk and your work in Debian. Uh, it could be also interesting to do uh, backport packages to know if a package is in stable. Um, do you? It is uh, possible to have, uh, for example, with a color box to know mm. if a package is in stable? Uh, I'm you mean when preparing some package for backports? Yeah. Uh, I guess it's feasible. Basically, uh, the idea is just looking at either um, uh, excuses or maybe uh, you, you, c you can basically do the same with the archive <laughs> itself and just look at uh, dependencies and so on and establish some graph. Uh, it's really flexible and really dumb, actually. Um, you, you might run into issues with uh, version, depend version dependencies and provides and so on. 
but uh, I guess you could just use apt to figure out the, build depend the dependencies and then render that uh, on some graph. I believe apt even has some dot command or had at some point, so it should be feasible. Just uh, one short comment. Uh, you mentioned that you wanted to look up sources on the snapshot.debian.org for to find out binary mapping. Yep. So binary mapping. Actually, what you really want to check is the binary package because uh, sometimes you can have a binary package built by multiple source package, and to find out which one, which source is really responsible for it, you have to look up the. Binary yeah, package. but I wanted to keep the short, the talk short, <laughs> okay. so I didn't dwell into the specifics of right. multi sources and multi packages. But yeah, okay. So uh, I had a question also. Uh, the graph includes uh, all the relationships uh, based on the migrates after uh, feed and, and blocked by. I didn't do mention the distinction uh, as well to yes. keep it short. Uh, but th does uh, this list include all dependencies or only dependencies where there are different versions in testing and in and stable? It's all packages mentioned in the excuses. Okay. So, so then you would have to ask uh, Evo. Okay. That means yeah, okay. Uh, the graph might expand uh, if uh, other packages get uploaded. Uh, uh, it might later. Later, okay. So uh, the, the if uh, the excuses file lists either blocked by or migrates after, that means that it can only migrate if the other package migrates as well. If there's a dependency that is already satisfied in testing, then it won't be mentioned. So if it's mentioned in the excuses file, then it's really uh, something that needs to be fixed for it uh, to migrate. Two minutes still. We have to just one, one, two minutes for the latest question. Okay. Feel free to grab me for any more questions during the day or tomorrow morning. And again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Cyril. Thank you very much.